Okay, welcome to the stewards. Glad to have you on. Eva William or Why are you saying the live video has ended? Oh, maybe I had hit the wrong thing. No idea. It's either gonna be William yeah. or You are in the video. Or oh, what's the name? Okay. See, you, there are seven connections already. As soon as you send them the note, they'll get online. Now I'm going to leave a message. God bless you. Welcome to St. Luther's Prayer Call. Which is, I'm sorry. Welcome to our Bible class, which is called, please. What can they see? All right, Miss Stubbs, so glad you could be on. All right. Yeah, we miss you when you're gone, so glad you're on. Thank you. Okay, God bless. Did somebody else join? All right, Miss Morris. We got a good group on tonight. Glad you're on. I'm glad for Susan Thank you. I had it wrong. Okay. All right. That can happen. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it. Okay, good. I mean, we see that. We ain't looking for that. We see, see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody's seeing it, I guess. Some people on there asking questions. Yeah, it just bleeped on there. Oh, What happened? Hello. Yes. God bless you. Who just joined? Uh, All right, Sister Moulton, welcome to the Bible class. We'll be getting we'll be getting in about three minutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, she did. She did. It's still. It's, it's like hard. Uh, it's still in the system. Tasha Reed made a comment about your mask. <laughs> what's, what's her comment? What's her, what's her problem? <laughs> God bless you. Welcome to St. Luther's Bible class. Who joined? I'm happy to have you on. Thanks, ma'am. Okay, Percy and Janet Davis. Loretta Hollenberg is on for a singleton. Lonnie Sutton is watching. Miss Bernice Pittman is watching. Uh, Tasha also suggests your colors go well for JSU. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mom's on. Carolyn Tate, so we've got a really good group and a number on, on the phone. Let us wish good things in each front of each other. That's my message. Thank you. God bless you. Welcome to St. Luther's Bible class. We're going all the way. All the way where? Who just joined me? To the long way. To the long way. See, y'all be queer. Uh, Tommy Marshall says you can't talk with that mask on. <laughs> <laughs> I just put it up there so everybody can see it. How about that? Forty-five seconds. You just put it back in there. You said about how many seconds? Forty-five. Okay, seconds. okay forty-five okay. seconds. We will be getting shortly. Okay, take your name. We hear you singing that. Pardon? They said he's glad you're, we're practicing social distancing. All right. What time does the uh, 7 o'clock Bible class start? 7 o'clock. Uh, 
Father God, we just thank you for your grace. And God, we thank you for your mercy. And Father God, we uh, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to, to spend time with each other. And we know as we are together that you'll be in the midst of us. And we pray, oh God, that you being in the midst of us will, will cause your word to be magnified within us and through us. And we pray, oh God, that uh, your word reaches, that your word touches, and that your word changes. In your precious name, we do pray. Amen. 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 Saints Amen. of God, it's happy, we're glad, and all that kind of stuff just to be in front of you one more time. Just talking about this this subject that uh, that we started upon about uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, this week. Um, the subject is learning to love adversity. Learning to love adversity. And I know that can be difficult to swallow. Um, of course, it might be asked, why would I even want to? Is that even possible uh, to, to love adversity? And uh, think about this. Have you ever uh, had to learn to love somebody? Or something. Um, broccoli, you couldn't stand it. Kale, you couldn't stand it. But uh, when you start to realize the benefit of it, you, you learn to love it. Uh, or a person. Uh, you met somebody, they, they had some positive qualities, but they also had some negative qualities. But as they begin to get close to you, uh, what happened is uh, your love for them overshadowed anything and, and everything that was uh, negative. Um, key here for us is uh, how we actually look at adversity. You know, how you look at a thing uh, can can determine and uh, how you take it or even how you respond to it. And so uh, let's get going with this uh, this lesson on, on, on tonight. I guess right off the bat, you know, we ask who in the right mind uh, would love adversity. Uh, generally, when um, when when we suffer or when we go through something, um, especially us, when I say us, when I mean Christian believers, uh, we are surprised, uh, astonished, disappointed, uh, and wonder why we have to go through it. Uh, we say God is a protector. Why isn't he protecting? We say God is a healer. Why isn't he healing? But being a genuine uh, believer puts us in uh, a tough spot sometimes. It, ju it just does. Uh, being living in a, in a corrupt world, the world that, in which we live in, uh, oftentimes I, I question why. Uh, just, just why? God didn't just come down here and just do something about it. Hmm. But uh, he doesn't always work that way. Uh, he, he's, he's doing some stuff right now, though. You better believe me. And then there are also the, the issues where people are often so uh, opposed to us uh, that, that even sometimes we doubt ourselves and our, our own uh, beliefs. But in the Bible... There are just plenty examples of God's anointing and beloved who had to deal with adversities. And so we need to really look at and learn what is required because it is understandable how we would not uh, understand. It's understandable how we would be troubled over uh, dealing with at Adversity. Let's begin by looking at uh, 1 Peter, uh, fourth chapter in the in the twelfth verse. First of all, listen to what Peter says. He says, "Beloved, think it not strange." In other words, he's saying, "Don't be surprised. Think it not strange concerning uh, the fiery trial." And they are not to destroy you. They are not to harm you. But they are to try you, to, to test you, as though some strange thing happened to you. He, Peter is giving them 
the benefit of his experience and his relationship with with uh, with God and with with Christ, beloved. Think it not strange. Don't you be surprised. Don't you run away from mm -hmm. firsthand experience he's given them. And, and he's preparing them for what's to come. He, he's not he's not giving them this speech such that they uh, build him up or puff him up. But he's giving them the benefit of his experience such they can be ready for what's to come. And he went beyond just calling a trial. He called it fiery. Mm -hmm. And so uh, somebody else who, who had some experience, and that would be uh, a brother Paul. You know, Paul said, hey, look, I worked harder, uh, been put in jail more often than anybody. He says, five different times, five different times, the Jews gave me 39 lashes. He's three times. I was beaten with rods. Once I was even stoned and, 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 and left for dead. He says, I faced danger in the city. I faced danger in the desert. I faced danger on the stormy seas. And then he says, I faced danger from men who claim to be Christians but are not. Adversities, adversities, trouble, hardship, difficulties, they prove your determination. What kind of stuff you really made of? When you, when you can, can, what was, what's the commercial with, uh, with the, the Timex? Takes a licking. Takes a licking. Keeps on ticking. But keep on ticking. <laughs> Well, adversities prove uh, your determination. Again, the kind of stuff, stop, you made of. And what, and what does that mean? What, what I'm made of? What is, what does it prove? What's the purpose of the test? What's the purpose of, of the trial? To get down to the, to the nitty gritty, it is, can you be trusted with the assignment of the work that God has in store for you? What's to come? Can you be trusted with it? And, and, and why is that a question? That's a question because we have so many who quit. Can I say that again? <laughs> we have so many people who get started along the path, take on an assignment, um, meet a little resistance and can't handle it, and quit. And so these fiery trials uh, their purpose is not to not to beat us up, not to tear us down, but it's really to lift us up and to prepare us. And so God will test our character. He'll test our integrity. He'll test our motivation. And he tests our faith. And you can't go to the next level. You can't until, until God proves that he can trust you right where you are. In other words, he doesn't try to build on a foundation that's already shaken and that's already sh shifting. Jeremiah 12 and 5 says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace wherein thou trusted, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of the Jordan? Do you understand what's being said there? That, 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 that on the easy side, you're struggling, then it can't get any more difficult. That if it got any more difficult and you can't deal with the easy, then we know what's going to happen. Let me uh, look at this from the Amplified uh, Translation. But the Lord rebukes Jeremiah's impatience, and that he's talking to him. I mean, you, if you if you can't if you can't deal with the footman, you, you, how can you run with the horseman? That that impatience speaks speaks uh, loudly. 
But the Lord rebukes Jeremiah's impatience, saying, If you have raced with men on foot, and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? And if you take the flight in a land of peace where you feel secure, then what will you do when you tread the tangled maze of jungle, hunted by lions in the swelling and the flooding of Jordan? In other words, if you can't handle the easy stuff, if you can't handle the easy stuff, then how can I trust you with uh, the hard stuff? If if a mere headache, if a mere headache makes you stay at home, just think about you really getting sick. Hard times come, and hard times increase your your patience. Why and how? One of the reasons is because hardships are never quick, never over quick. It always takes some some time, and and some hearts. Ships, uh, to be honest with you and truthful, will last a whole lifetime. Uh, Romans five and three says, and not only so, but here's where this where this love for tribulation comes in. He says, but we glory in tribulations also. Not that we 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 celebrate and we have a party, but we have hope in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations work it patience. See, if I know what the outcome of something is going to be, then I can be comfortable in it. it I, I can deal with being uncomfortable if I know there's something on the other side of it that's going to be profitable to me. So, but why is it hard to wait? Somebody talk to me. Why is it so hard to, to wait? until the manifestation comes of what you've been praying for. Why is it so hard? You want to get some answers? Let me get some answers. One answer, Pastor, is coming in as we are, we have uh, been taught to be a microwave generation of people. <laughs> Getting everything right now. Want it right now. That's why it's so hard to wait. Want it right now. Don't want to put in the time. Why, though? Why? I'm acting like a little kid now. Why? Why? So we've been taught to react and respond, and, you know, uh, as a, and they call us the microwave generation. But why? Here's an answer: because we're impatient. Because waiting takes patience, and that's a spirit that God gives us when we trust Him. We can't do it on. Absence of trust, um, weakness, uh, seeing things through the natural versus the supernatural, leaning upon our own understanding and our own uh, experience. Time in here, we want it when we want it. It's something. And fear the unknown. Okay. What will happen if I wait? Psalms 27, 14 says what? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Put the microwave mentality to the side. Wait on the Lord. And while you are waiting, when you're doing your part, while you are waiting and trusting, he does his part. He strengthens thine heart. Psalms 130 and 5. I wait for the Lord. 
not just me and my physicality. It, it, I spiritually wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. Mm -hmm. And and what, what am I leaning on? In his word. In his word do I hope. That's why I can wait. That's why I can lean. That's why I can trust him. Because I, I believe in his word. I believe in his promises. And so in, in, this, in this scripture, uh, the psalmist believes uh, God's promises so firmly uh, because he was convinced that the Lord is worthy of his trust. How many of you ever waited on a bus? That's the microwave generation never waited on a bus. But, but if you waited on the bus, how much confidence did you have? Anybody riding a bus now? <laughs> <laughs> how about, how about uh, waiting on an airplane? I've done that. I've done that. And, 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 are you, are, and just think about it. How, how confident are you that it's going to be on time? The, the whole the whole uh, uh, journey when you're flying is, is one of high anxiety especially if you've got to go up and down more than once uh, on a flight you, you're worried about whether or not you're going to make the exchange you're worried about whether or not it's going to be there or not and don't let there be uh, bad weather about waiting for food? Do we show patience? No. No. Here's one waiting on a raise. <laughs> show patience. How about waiting on a baby? Patience? Is patience required? Isaiah the 40th chapter and the 31st uh, verse says what? But they that wait, not on the bus, not on the airplane, not on the child, not in the food line, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. See, it, it, the waiting part and being uncomfortable with waiting, really, it really is a weakness and it really pulls something out of you. I mean, I'm seriously, serious. Think about that 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 uh, mm -hmm. air travel. How how you didn't walk, you didn't drive, but still, when you make it to your destiny, you're still tired. Especially if there were some kind of issue where all you did was just wait in the waiting room. That waiting pulls something out of you. But when you wait on the, the Lord, he renews your strength. And with your renewed strength, those that wait upon him, he makes a promise. He said, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So what is, again, what is the connection between waiting and the renewal of strength? When, when, when you're waiting on yourself, who are you depending upon? Yourself. Yourself. But when you're waiting on God, the difference is when you're waiting on yourself, all you do is just get tired, confused. But when you're waiting on God, he makes a promise to you that not only will he give you the, the strength to wait, but there is hope in his promise that not only he's going to do what he's promised, but in doing what he's promised, he's going to make sure you get to fly like an eagle. And so, you can put behind your losses. You can put behind anything that you've gone through, your, the, the mistakes you've made, the, the adversities. You can put them um, behind you. That ought to make some people really, really, really happy. 
Philippians, the third chapter, 13th and 14th verse. Uh, that's what Paul says, because we talk about putting stuff big behind us. Uh, brethren, well, you know when he says brethren, who he's talking to, right? Mm -hmm. He's talking to church folk. Mm -hmm. Brother, I count not myself to have apprehended. Uh, meaning, you know what? I, I, I know I haven't arrived, okay? I'm not all led in a bag of, bag of chips. He says, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind me. And I reach forth unto those things which are before. I reach. I reach forth. I reach towards. I, it's like I'm in, I'm in the middle of, of, of a circumstance or a situation. I'm leaving what's behind me. And, I, and it, you know, he lets you know right from the get-go that he hasn't apprehended, so he's not there. So so I'm, I'm going to put it behind I'm in the middle of this thing. I'm leaving the adversity, and I'm reaching. I'm not there, but but I'm reaching. He said, and he says, I press, I press toward the mark yes. for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. They, okay, so there's a, there's a calling on our life. There's something He wants for us. It's there. We're in the middle of some adversity. There there's a there's a stain. Uh, we got a we got a, a limp, but like Paul says, you, you gotta you gotta turn it go. You gotta turn it loose. You gotta let it go. And while it may be difficult, anybody know that it's difficult sometimes to put some stuff behind you. And so, but what you gotta do is to ask God to to take care of restoring what the devil has stolen from you. What's behind you? Any, anybody care to say? What's behind you that you need to forget about? Mistakes. Can we be real for a moment? Can you forget about it? Because it's in the past? You should. Because you can't change it. Failed marriage? Failures at raising your children? The abortion? Or having a child out of wedlock? Yo-yo weight problem? Adultery? Fornication? The financial mistakes that you, you might have made? Put those behind you. Here's what the enemy would do. He will use your adversity or your mistakes to beat you over the head to cause you to discount the hope that, that Christ has this hope of the high calling. See, there, there's a bigger prize at play, but because you're still holding on to your own mistakes, you will convince yourself that you're not worthy. And you will stop striving. So, here's what you got to do. You got to tell yourself. Don't, don't worry about telling somebody else. Start with yourself first. Tell yourself, I know I blew. I know I blew. But the very thing that was meant to, to take me out, I'm not going to let it. Because, what? I, I, I've been sick. Okay, yeah, yep. Yeah, I'm still limping. But I am healed of the Lord. you got to tell yourself, I am blessed and I'm prosperous. I, it, it, I may not have anything in my pocket right now, but, but I'm blessed and I'm prosperous. I do have a destiny and a future. I know I've made some mistakes, and I've made some mistakes more than once. Doesn't matter. I'm put, putting that behind me, and I'm going to continue to press forward. I am both anointed and I am appointed. you got to talk to yourself. If you can't convince yourself, who can you convince? 
if you can't win an argument with yourself, think about that. If you can't win an argument with yourself, who can who can you who can you win an argument with? Your devil, the devil is the is is your adversary. He, he's the one you fight. He, he's the one that's in your mind. You don't really have to fight with anybody else. And he wants to play on your adversity. First Peter five and five says, "Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another." But here's here's where we gotta get to. It says, "And be clothed with humility, for God resisted the proud, and then He gives grace to the humble, to the humble." What does it mean to be humble? You know, I, I could use a couple of answers on that. What does it mean to be humble? What is what is what does it look like? Humble. Is being humble the same thing as being weak? No. No. Humble can mean to be content. We have an answer here, Pastor, saying to be modest. Be modest, mm -hmm. And it, what does it what is what does modesty look like? Is it, is it modesty in our in our dress? In our in our talk? How do, how do you, if, would you call yourself humble? Think, think about that. The, the, the word is telling us to be humble. Would you call your, would you call, would you say that you're a, a humble person? Here's some examples. To put others before yourself is humbleness. Uh, to waiting on the Lord is being humble before the Lord. Helping others and not boasting about it. Being calm, not boastful. What, what's, what's there to boast about? I, I like that one. It, 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 humble being the opposite of, of boasting. But I want to get specifically to something. But what, what's, what do we have to to boast about. All of us are striving for something. What? We, when was the last time you boasted about something? I asked you about being humble. <laughs> Tell you what, adversities will keep you humble. Whether you, whether you like it or not, hardships will keep you humble. H hardships will take the boast right out of your mouth. And being humble is requirement number one for obtaining the grace of God. First Peter 5th chapter 6 to 7 verses, it says, Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That he may lift you up. That he may change you in due time. And then it says, cast all your care upon him. Why? For he careth for you. Wait with patience because that, that allows God to exalt you. Humble yourself. He will lift you up. And then go to the 8th eight, eight verse. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, yeah. is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. In other words, he's going to take from you. He's going to steal 
from you. Sometimes he won't take it, but he'll make you think that you lost it. Anybody ever ever thought that you that you lost something? That you were convinced that you had lost it, and when really you really had it? Second Corinthians, the twelfth chapter, the seventh verse. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. Here's Paul. Says I, he had an issue. And he prayed three times. But he said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to buffet me, to make sure I didn't get the big head. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Lest I should present myself to be more than I am. Paul had a thorn. What's your thorn? What's your thorn? What, what's your thorn? A thorn can be spiritual suffering, uh, such as uh, attack by Satan, or even opposition by men. Also, a thorn can be physical suffering. Now, if I ask you, what's your thorn? I probably can get all kind of answers. What's your thorn, folks? Can I get some answers in the room while those who are behind me catch up? Mine's time. Time. Lack of or too much? <laughs> Mismanagement. <laughs> Mismanagement. What's a thorn? Hugging down. What what is it that you that you would you would pray to God to remove? Chronic pain. It's <clears throat> a good one. Chronic 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 pain. Chronic means that, that you can't explain it. You can't. You almost can't predict it. Sometimes we think we can, but we can't really. You have uh, any weaknesses? We have. We haven't shaken selfish selfishness. Selfishness. And then uh, attacked by evilness and things that bother you. I think there's some probably more profound thorns than, than what I'm hearing. Uh, either way, this is uh, <coughs> the response that Paul got. Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 9th and the 10th verse. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, there is no lack, there is no slack, there is no error in my strength that, that is applied specifically to your weakness, to your thorn. And then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my Weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. Hmm. You remember a few minutes ago, I asked you, what did you have to boast about? And I'm sure you were thinking about something, something positive, something, something, something great, something that that's occurred. You, that's what you were thinking about, but. Here is Paul saying, I'll boast, I, I'm boasting in my weaknesses. Not, not, my, not my strength. I'm boasting in my weaknesses. Because when I put my weakness out front, that's when God comes in and applies his strength. And so he says, that is why. He says, for, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. 
He's saying, I love adversity. I love adversity. In insults, hardships, adversity, persecution, adversity, difficulty, adversities. Why? I'm going to have to send somebody out of the room. <laughs> For when I am weak, then I am strong. In other words, the weaker I get, the stronger I become. Does that make any sense, anybody? Mm -hmm. The weaker I get, the stronger I become. Why? Because of God's work within me. There's some more thorns. Let me hear some more thorns. Pride, sloth, uh, how people perceive me, finding it hard to forgive someone who's done you wrong. And so, it was, so pride can be a thorn. Would you boast in your pride? Some do. A lot, of, a lot of people. I'm proud. Yeah, I've heard somebody say I'm proud about it. And that pride that they're boasting in is strength. Here's the thorn: addictions. Addictions. And does it does it make sense to say that to say I'm going to boast in my addiction? Other other than to say I, I'm I'm accepting it. I'm not trying to hide behind it. I'm putting it out on on front street. The here is my addiction. And the reason why I'm willing to do it and will, real, willing to, to put it out there and, and face it is because when I do, that's when God can come in. The long as I try to, to hide it, the long as I'm trying to deal with it my way, on my own, then there's no room for the perfecting power of God to move in and make a change. See, diversities actually show you God's favor. The adversities humble us, beat us up, chastise us, show us where we're weak, prune us of our self-sufficiency and the wrong kind of pride and arrogance. And so when God sends them to take we should have on it, just like Paul had, is that, man, I know something's good is going to come out of this because he promised. He says his grace is sufficient. Remember Hebrews 12 and 6, which says, For whom the Lord loveth, he whips and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Philippians 2 and 13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is an acceptance of God's will. How many of you have, have really, really and truly accepted God's will for your life? For your for your for your life. Not just today, uh, not just what happened yesterday, but for to, to the totality of of your life. How many of you have you really just swallowed the fact that, that everything that's occurring to you, for you, by you, is connected? That, that it is truly in preparation for something to come. Job says, for he, for, for he knoweth the way I take. I don't know, but he knows the way I, I, I take. He knows the, the reasons for my choices. He understands. But he, he that, that B clause says, but when he had tried me, first of all, he knows, he knows my direction. He knows where I am going. Nevertheless, though, he tries me. He tests me. 
He makes sure that I am ready for where he's going to take me. And the net result is I shall come forth as gold. I accept God's will on my life. I make mistakes. I realize that I can't get to where God wants to take me until I put those things in the past, in the past, and I continue to strive and work and reach and allow him to perfect me. And But when I do that, when I do that, when he has tried me, then I know that I shall come forth as pure gold. Now, some folk stop at copper. In other words, they can't take nothing. Won't take nothing. They stop at copper. Some folk will even go as far as silver. That's good enough for them. But I don't know about you, but if I, I, I won't go. I won't go. God tries us for, 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 for reason. He wants us to reflect his image. Why should I love adversity? Because going through adversity not only gives me patience, but it's, it, it is a trial. And when I make it through the trial, and, and I should not be worried about making it through the trial, because there is hope, there's a promise on the other side. And I should understand that, that what he's doing is for my good. God wants you to reflect his image. He wants you to be so completely changed into the goal that when you are in uh, the atmosphere of others, others, they won't see you, but they'll see the Christ in you. They'll see the result of what, what God has done for you. Can God brag on you? Mm -hmm. Adversities make you more like like Jesus. How does that? Wow. I guess before I explain, how many of you want to be more like Jesus? Mm. <laughs> Isaiah 53 and 3. He is despised and rejected <laughs> of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. How many of you really want to be like Jesus? Then if the answer is yes, I want to be like Jesus, then then you've got to acknowledge that if if Jesus was despised and rejected of men, you've got the same thing coming. You've got some sorrows to deal with. You you got some you're gonna be acquainted with some grief. But God is orchestrating this thing. For what purpose? That we will surrender to his will. And surrender never comes without a struggle. Mark the 14, chapter 36, verse, Jesus said, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Yes. Nevertheless, though, not what I will, but what thou will. If Jesus, a man of sorrow, Jesus, a man acquainted with griefs, still puts everything underneath the umbrella of his father. Whatever your will is for my life, that is my will. And so you've got to know that in the midst of your adversity, your circumstance, your loss, your storm, whatever it is, you, you've, got, you've got help. You've got help. And so I asked you tonight, have you bowed your knee in surrender? Or are you still struggling? Take your adversities and circumstances and let them drive you to your knees in prayer. Embrace your adversities. Uh, 
understand your weaknesses. Ask God to help you see his will for your life. And then you continue to strive, but yet be humble. Um, let, let me give you a personal um, example before um, I continue or I go any any, any uh, farther. Um, Pastor Pope Jr. knows without a shadow of a doubt that he has been called to preach. I know that. There, there is no doubt in my mind. But every time, every time that I am given the opportunity, whether it be here or somewhere else, to speak, the butterflies are just awesome. Just awesome. Uh, it is a point of weakness. You'll see me walk out and maybe put to, to go, and you think I I, I I go out and I and I come back with the robe on and and I've stopped and I and I've gone to the to the restroom. Sometimes I have a hard time coming out. I really do. It is in those moments that 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 I realize that it's not me. That is that is him. And that when I acknowledge my weakness, that's when his strength comes through. And it's not my message, it's his yes. message. When I'm humble, when I'm weak, that's when he's strong. That when you acknowledge that and release yourself to that, then the very gift that God has given you, then he's able to take that gift and take it to another level. Out of pride, when you hold on to it and try to use it, it never extends itself to the manner in which God would have it to. No matter what it is. No matter what it is. Second Kings is the, the sixth chapter, 15 to 16 verse. Remember. It's how you look at things and, and, and how, how, how you see it adversity with respect to whether or not you will face it in the proper manner. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. The enemy will sometimes will only allow you to see those who are with them and not those who are with us. When you when you look out of the natural eyes, that's what you'll see. You'll see the adversity. You'll see those things that attach <coughs> themselves to adversity and, and, and not realize that you're not in this thing all alone. And so, how are you looking at your adversity? Are you looking at them through your, your natural eyes? Are you looking at them through the eyes of the Holy Spirit? That sixth chapter begins with that 17th verse. And Elijah prayed, Oh Lord, open his eyes, and so that he may see. Man, that's my prayer for uh, people of St. Luke, that the Lord would open your eyes. And then the Lord opened the servant's eye. And he looked, man, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Looking out of the same set of eyes. The eyes did not change. He's looking out of the same set of eyes. And when it says he opened his eyes, that wasn't more about physicality, but that was more about an opening of his spiritual eyes, seeing things a little bit differently. And so 
with the, the help of the, the Holy Spirit, open your eyes to see the supernatural. Not where you are, but where God is trying to take you. It, in the natural, it may not look good. It may not sound good. But if you can see it in the, the supernatural, then you recognize it as a promise of God. And what will happen is you'll begin to reach. You will begin to allow him to mold you and to shape you. And you won't run from adversity, but you will embrace adversity. Why? Because his grace is sufficient. Yeah. And so, and, and here's where we end. No matter what they say, you always say, who's they? But no matter what they say or what it seems like, regardless of what's going on in your life, God's army is all around you. And so if you just stand, not give in, not give up, not quit, God will change your weakness, not into your strength, but God will change your weakness into his strength. And the way that works is when you're not leaning on your own self-sufficiency, but when you have learned to lean and to trust in him. Questions? Any questions on the phone? Press star one if you need to speak on the phone to ask a question. Comment. You have God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's some, uh, about it. I know there's a sort of a, uh, a, a time delay. Uh, yeah, I know if we were uh, live right now, and I would be hearing uh, Reverend Robinson say something. <laughs> He's on the phone. Somebody ought to push star <laughs> one and let him say something. <laughs> Reverend Robinson, you still on the phone? How can one obtain God's supernatural abilities and strength? How can one obtain God's supernatural okay, well, hey, hey, Pastor, here he is. He was, he was watching and we were listening, so if he finna say something, say something, please. Who will put it on there? Yeah, Pastor, you was looking at him, he was going to say something. You were going good on that, with that, I like what you're working with, and, uh, what's that? Uh, uh, Corinthians, second Corinthians 12. Chapter about the song was in all place. Uh, I was trying to get to you a long time when you went through that in the things that we suffered. There was able to do it. All right. Uh, God, God wants to move in, uh, but he he can't move in. He can't move in supernaturally. Thank you. When we are in the way, in the way, and, and, and it is about it is about trusting him and 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 accepting him. A lot of times we we look back over our past and we we ask the question or say, I just don't know how. Supernaturally is is how. Supernaturally is how. And, and just like you look to the past, you can look to the future with the same supernatural beliefs. Did, 
there's so many avenues we do it. Uh, how we 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 know we don't we know we don't qualify for something, but we apply anyway because we we believe we pray for it. Well, what enables us to grasp and take a hold of what God has promised us is the understanding of the foundation that he's tried to build. Again, nobody, you would build on a shaky foundation. And so you just got to know that, that I may want something supernaturally. It requires something supernatural. I may want it. However, I've got to acknowledge what he's doing in my life right now. Not the past. But remember, I got I got to put the past. I got to put the past behind me. But I, I've got to emerge myself into His Word. His Word helps me to understand what is taking place in my life. More Word, more growth. More Word. The stronger my relationship with God. More word, the more I'm able to deal with my adversities. More word is, is, is a deeper understanding of the hope and why I should glory in my infirmities. Because I understand what's, what's to come. And when I doubt, doubting means I'm going to go around this mountain. I'm going to stay in this desert. Even though God has promised me a land flowing with milk and honey, my doubt says I'm going to stay right here. Right here. Mm -hmm. But when I trust, supernatural things happen. Feed me by day, lead me by night. Victory after victory. I wear shoes that don't wear out. Supernatural. It just happens. And what can you tell a person or persons who really don't believe that they can change when they are in despair, whether it's drugs, alcohol, jobless, etc.? Everything starts with accepting uh, Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. I, I mean, they, I, I can't I, to tell you how you can uh, break a habit. Uh, again, that's you leaning on you. God does the work. Uh, you do your part with respect to uh, planting or watering or, or God convicts them. God is the one who does the convicting. He's also the one that accepts the, the repenting. Uh, he's the, also the one that judges the faith. He's also the one that then does the turnaround. He does the work. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is just plant the seed. And see, you, you don't have to take, you know, take responsibility for whether or not they changed their life or not. I, I talked to him and he changed his life. That's one for me. And and I changed his he changed his life. That's two for me. No, 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 no. All your responsibility is is just deliver the word about who Christ is and what Christ can do. It's sort of it's sort of like that the waitress that, that comes around and says, um, "Would you like some water?" Or after a while, they stop asking if you want more water. They just keep pouring it. And then when you finally say, "No, I don't want any more water," or "I don't want any water," they keep sitting there. They keep bringing water. They don't fall out crying because you don't want water. Uh, you got to continue to deliver the message. Alrighty, we're done. Uh, well, before we're done, I'm gonna ask 